Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites, and the Sidonians, and the Hevites who lived on Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hamon as far as Libo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel, to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishadim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishadim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel, who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest forty years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites, and went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded, Silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade. For he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, Surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. And there lay their Lord, dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed. And he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sierra. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel 
went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for eighty years. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed six hundred of the Philistines with an ox god, and he also saved Israel. Interesting story. Yeah? Um, and all of it true. Every single word. Um, and so this morning, my desire is to unpack that, is, is to, to make it uh, clear to us what it is that God wants us to hear. Um, and so before we do that, uh, permit me to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me that God would do that which only he can do, uh, and that is save many. So heads bowed, eyes closed. Uh, Father, we are incredibly thankful uh, for your word, um, that it is living and active, uh, that it continues to transform the individual lives of people. And so God, would you do that yet again this morning? Would you meet us where we are as we jump into this passage and as we uh, read uh, these events? Lord, I pray uh, that we would see you for who you are. I pray that our hearts would be open, that our minds would be open. I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and breathe life into this place. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, uh, we opened up the book of Judges. It was the intro, uh, and I walked through it. If you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that message. Um, but I didn't finish the way that I wanted to. Uh, if you remember, uh, I just felt that God was doing something in this place and decided to go a different direction, but still landed the plane. And so here's what I did not say last week. At the end of Judges uh, chapter 2, we, we see that, that, that God says, no, no, no I'm going to leave some of the Canaanites here so that I might test you. We actually see that again in Judges chapter 3. Let me read it to you. Verse 1 says, these are the nations the Lord left in order to test all those in Israel who had experienced none of the wars in Canaan. This was to teach the future generations of the Israelites how to fight in battle, especially those who had not fought before. We see this again in verse 4. The Lord left them to test Israel to determine if they would keep the Lord's commands he had given their ancestors through Moses. Now this leaves us wondering, why would God do this? Why would he not give us complete victory? Why would he leave some of the, the Canaanites, some of the enemies uh, here well, it's so that he would test them? The Lord continues to do this even today. But I know many of you, you, you wonder, you ask the question, God, I, I submit to you, I surrender to you, but why? Why do I still find myself navigating through trials and tests? Well, it's because God wants to ensure that you continue to keep your eyes on him. Yeah. That if he was to remove every single trial, there is a danger for us to go look at me instead of look at God. There are times when God leaves things unresolved in our lives. A job rejection, a conflict with a Christian who refuses to be reconciled to us, a situation in the church that we are not entirely happy with, a heartache in the family, or a lingering sickness. God will not always keep our lives neat and tidy. He will do things we do not expect 
and take us into situations that we may find difficult. Why? So that we should continue to depend on him and so that our faith would continue to grow. Friends, weakness is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing for the children of God. It's not a bad thing for the church. It's because when we are weak, we run to God. It's in Him we find our strength. God will leave trials and tests in our lives to see whether we will choose Him and choose to be obedient to His word. This is true. We see this in the life of Paul the Apostle. Where he says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 from verse 8 to 10, he says this. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Have you begged? Are there things in your life that you have pleaded to the Lord to remove? Verse 9, each time he said, my grace is all you need. I want you to hear this morning that, that as you beg and as you plead, that you would also hear the voice of God saying, my grace is sufficient for you. My power works best in weakness, God says. So now I am glad to boast in my weaknesses, Paul says, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so friends, we should have a different perspective when we navigate through our trials and tests. Now this is not to say that some of the trials and tests and the difficulties in your life are brought about because you are sinful. That's just you. But there are things where you're going, God, no, hold on. I'm, I'm following you. I'm trusting you. I'm, I've searched my own heart. I've examined my own heart, and yet I, I, there's nothing there. There's no sin there. But why still this test? Because your grace is sufficient. And we see this over and over and over again in the book of Judges that they have victory, but then we still find some of the enemies there, some of the, the, the trials there. Well, it's, he, God's saying, I don't want you to be like your, the previous generation, those who went before you. They, they get some victory, and then they go, well, I'm done with God. It's all about us now. And so this morning, I want us to look at the story of Ehud. We're going to start at, at verse 12, Judges chapter 3, verse 12. Remember the pattern, that, that, that God would save them. He, he raises up a judge, and, and he saves the Israelites, and then they celebrate, and for a season, they follow him, and they trust him, and then they take their eyes off God, and then things go really, really bad very quickly. And so verse 12, the Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He gave King Eglon of Moab power over Israel. Why? Because they had done what was evil in the Lord's sight, the consequences of our sin. Friends, sin has consequences. Yeah. Just want to let you know. Sin has consequences. After Eglon convinced the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join forces with him, he attacked and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites served King Eglon of Moab 18 years. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord. And he raised up Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed Benjaminite. Now, you might be wondering why, why they put that in there. Is that important? Now, I know today being left-handed is, is not a big deal. All right? It's not a big deal. They make uh, scissors now for left-handed folks. I, I, there's a whole bunch of other things they make for left-handed folks. I am not left-handed, but my daughter is. Our eldest daughter is left-handed, and, and, and she has her, kind of her own pair of scissors that every now and then I'll pick up and try to use, and I'm like, this isn't working. Why is this not working? But well, we live in a world today where they now cater for left-handed people. I remember in primary school where that was not the case. And so why mention it here? Well, because in this particular culture, 
being left-handed was a bad thing. It was a bad thing. Being left-handed was, was considered to be one of no use. And not just in this culture, but, but in many cultures around the world. I've heard of cultures where, where if you are left-handed and they, they see you picking up something with your left hand, they, they would strike your left hand with some sort of instrument like a ruler or, or, or a stick because they don't want you to be left-handed. We live in a right-handed world. In fact, in Latin, left-handed means to be sinister. In, in French, uh, the word is uh, gouge. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Gouge, uh, which, which c c comes from the, the, the origins of, of being clumsy. That's how they saw it, that if you were left-handed, you were a clumsy individual. In fact, in the old English, to be left-handed was to be considered weak or to be foolish. It's the same here in this culture. Being left-handed was, was not a good thing. But yet God raises up this left-handed man as a deliverer for them. The Israelites sent him with a tribute for King Eglon of Moab. Friends, this brings us to my first point, which is our deliverer comes from what is considered to be a place of weakness. This is what God wants us to see, that our, our deliverer, ultimately, our deliverer would come from a place that is considered weak. Our deliverer would be unsuspecting. Our deliverer would be unassuming. Let me explain. See, Ehud comes from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, this tribe is only mentioned once in the book of Judges, in chapter 1, verse 21. Now, you would remember last week uh, that, 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 that the, the tribes could not drive out the enemies. Right? That's what we were told over and over and over again. They could not drive out the enemies. But when we come to the, the tribe of Benjamin, we're told in chapter 1, verse 21, that they did not drive out the Jesuits from Jerusalem, that they simply just didn't want to. So while the other tribes, it was they could not, they could not, they could not, when it comes to the tribe of Benjamin, it was simply, oh, they just, they just didn't want to. This is not a good tribe. Unlike... Othniel, who, who we, we, we saw in the beginning part of Judges chapter 3, he was the first judge for Israel. Well, he came from the tribe of Judah. We're told that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Othniel is one of those guys that you're just like, you know what, I, just, I don't want to read about this guy because it just feels like his entire life is perfect. He's that epic guy. Not the case for Ehud. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. God raising Ehud as a deliverer for Israel is, is strange. It's strange. And, and it should carry the same strangeness as Nathaniel's question about Jesus when he asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's that strange. C can anything good come out of the tribe of Benjamin? And, and yet God raises up a deliverer from that very tribe. Ehud is from the wrong tribe. And like we just saw, he's also the wrong person physically. He's the wrong person physically, a left-handed man. If this story was being told to the Israelites, which it most definitely was over the, the history... They would get to that part and they'd go, hold on, whoa, he was left-handed? Like we could deal with the fact that he was from the tribe of Benjamin. But what, what is God going to do with a left-handed man? Ehud would have been seen as a weak appointment. And this will become a pattern in the book of Judges. The next judge that we'll look at next week is Deborah. She was a woman. This would have been considered a weak appointment. Or Barak, who was a coward. 
God, God, why would you raise up a coward? Can we go back to Othniel? Gideon or Gideon. Depending on where you went to school, we'll determine how you pronounce that. He led an army of 300, but remember, it started at 32,000. And God goes, no, too many, no, too many, no, too many. I mean, at some point you're like, God, hold on, hold on. Or Samson. But not just the, the book of Judges, the, the book directly after Judges is the book of Ruth. I mean, where does one even begin there? A whole book on a woman? Well, what about David? Now, I know we all think of David as the king, victorious, amazing. He was, he was. He was epic, poet. But the story of David begins with him as a young shepherd boy who had five stones and went up against a giant. It just, just doesn't make sense. God, wh why are you choosing these individuals? But all of this, all of this, not just Ehud, but, but all of this paves the way for the most unexpected, unassuming, considered weak Savior. Jesus Christ himself. I mean, he was born in a stable. It just doesn't make sense. Why, why would God do this? Friends, Jesus was a surprise to the forces of evil. They didn't see him coming. In, in, in the sport world, when you're left-handed, particularly in boxing, you, the, the phrase is that you're, you're a southpaw. Now today, that's an advantage. But back then, it was not. They didn't see him coming. Jesus was the southpaw knockout. And so in the events of Ehud, in this story, God is showing us that our salvation comes in the most unsuspecting ways. I mean, the cross and a king, how does that even make any sense? To, to look at the cross, to see Jesus on the cross and to say that is the king. It doesn't make sense. And this is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. He says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it is the power of God to us who are being saved. He goes on to later say in the same chapter, verses 22 to 23, for the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. How many of us are here, we're just seeking signs, that's it. A sign, give me a sign, give Lord a sign. In doing so, you run the risk of missing Jesus. Maybe for us, it's all about wisdom. It's being articulate with our words. You know so many people uh, that I run into and talk about Rooted Fellowship and what God has done, usually the first question is, so uh, are you guys, uh, are you reformed? And I go, oh, that's a great question. What does that mean? <laughs> and then they explain, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, a little bit of that. We're biblical. We love the Bible. Because it, it talks about Jesus and Jesus points us to the Father. But, but, but so many people today, it's all, about, it's all about what you're reading and how you say it. Run the risk of missing Jesus. How do we miss Jesus today? How, how, how is it possible for us to miss Jesus today? Well, it's because we, we, we come to the gospel, we come to the scriptures looking for, 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 for a, a particular kind of Jesus, but, but not recognizing that that Jesus is a Jesus that we have formed in our own imagination. Th th this is why the Pharisees always missed Jesus. 
See, they, they had put their Savior in a box. Here's how he is going to look. Here's how he's going to talk. This is what he's going to do. And then Jesus shows up, unassuming, unexpected. Like, it's just, it's confusing. But we are no different. We are no different. He doesn't look the way that we want him to look. He doesn't operate the way that we want him to operate. He doesn't say the things that we want him to say. And so we just go, no, this this cannot be Jesus. This can't be him. This can't be the savior of the world. And yet this is the pattern of God over and over and over and over again. We miss Jesus because we are looking for a different kind of savior. We miss Jesus because we are looking for a different kind of Savior. Now, I'm I'm about to say some things here, and I want you to stay with me. Stay with me. I know that many of us, we're looking for forgiveness. That's what we want. And I want that for you. I'll say it, I mean, over and over and over again, that, that, that we should forgive and you should think in your mind, like, who, who is, like, who am I holding on to that I need to release? And so we're looking for a Savior who's going who's gonna to bring that kind of forgiveness. Only, only if my father says he's sorry, then I will believe the gospel. Only, only if, if my boss says they're sorry will I believe in Jesus. I, friends, I want us, I want us to experience that kind of forgiveness. But hear me. Jesus, Jesus came to forgive us so that we might be reconciled to the Father. That's the forgiveness that you need. You need a Savior who can step in your place and take on the justice that God pours out so that we might be forgiven. That's the forgiveness that you need. Maybe some of you are here going, no, I need healing in my life. My body hurts. Oh, I've got this disease. The, the doctor just gave me a really bad report. I, I need healing, and I want to pray for you. At the end of this gathering, if that's you, you come up front, and we're going to pray and trust God. But hear me. The healing that you really need is, is your heart to be healed by God himself. That your heart is rotten, and you are broken, and you are in desperate need of a Savior. That's the healing that you need. That's the Savior that you need. Liberation. We talk about it all the time, especially in South Africa. And I get it. We, friends, I want us all to be liberated and not just be liberated, but to live as free people. But don't miss it. The liberation that you need, the liberation that this country needs, is to be free from sin and death. That's what we need. If we're out here just liberating people in the physical and completely neglecting the spiritual, we're in deep trouble. Because there are going to be a ton of people who show up one day and stand before a holy and sovereign God, and then he'll go, I have no idea who you are. Like, no, hold on. I showed up to the church gathering. I was in every midweek gathering. I was in the discipleship group. I read my Bible. I prayed. I don't know who you are. Or power. Power. We all, we all want power. But the power that you need is resurrection power. That's what you need. Power is not found in a title or in a job description or in a bank account. True power is found in the resurrection. That's the Savior that you need. And so, friends, if, if, we, if, we don't come, if we don't come to Jesus, for Jesus, we're in a lot of trouble. We can have everything else together. It can be shiny, it can be pretty, the best music, I mean, like, best coffee, you name it. But if we do not come to Jesus for Jesus, then what is the point? This is just another book club that shows up early in the morning. And to be honest, that's quite sad if that's the case. Let us not be like the Jews. Let us not be like the Gentiles. 
Let's be the children of God. And let's see Jesus for who he is. But God is saying here in the book of Judges, he, he's going to come in an unassuming, unexpected way. That it's through weakness that my power will be on display. And there is nothing more weak than a man beaten and broken on the cross. And yet it's through the cross that we find life and meaning and fulfillment. It's the gospel. And so in the story of Ehud, God wants us to see that, to not miss that. But the other thing that we see in the story of Ehud is that God mocks those who oppose him. God mocks those who oppose him. Now, now I know, and you guys are, are very uh, mature uh, human beings, but, but every time I read these verses, I always chuckle. Like, I can't help myself, because it's somewhat comedic. Let's, let's, can we be honest for a moment? Like, I know you guys are like, oh, super serious, you know, showed up to church, you know. Need to have my act together. But, but friends, when you read this, it's, I mean, you, you can't but chuckle. Like, uh, really? I mean, some of the things that, that are mentioned here, you're like, well, why did they mention that? That's interesting. This, this is, is, is meant to be comedic. True, but comedic. And, and it's because God is saying, th those who oppose me, things will not end well for you. And so let's read the story again. And let me try to bring up some of those things. Let's read from verse 16. So Ehud made himself a double-edged sword. I wish I had time. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Friends, it's all connected. Ehud made himself a double-edged sword, 18 inches long. It's about 45 centimeters long. He strapped it to his right thigh under his clothes. See, they, 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 would, have, they would have never looked as he made his way to Eglon uh, and, the, and the, the bodyguards were there. They would have naturally looked to his left side and then see nothing and then go, well, he must not be carrying. But he was. He strapped it to his right thigh under his clothes and brought the tribute to King Eglon of Moab, who was an extremely fat man. This is a man who, who, who was, was just, I mean, living the life. <laughs> Had taken over the Israelites and, and just literally living the good life. Hashtag. Verse 18, when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he dismissed the people who had carried it. At the carved images near Gilgal, he returned. It's almost like he's making his way, you know, out of, of this, this place where the king is. And, and as he walks past the, the, the idols that they were worshiping, look, the text doesn't tell us this, but, but I, I think this is what happened. He's walking and he goes, change of plan. He looks at these idols and, and he's now filled with rage. That this is what our people have to bow down to that we are not meant to live this way, that we are God's people. And so he stops and he ponders. He turns around and said, King Eglon, I have a secret message for you. That's a little sneaky, you left-handed man. <laughs> the king said, silence. Silence. And all his attendants left him. It must have been a thing. It's like when he says silence, it's like everyone knows there's time to leave the building, right? So they leave. Then Ehud approached him while he was sitting alone in his upstairs room where it was cool. See, Eglon was a complete tyrant, a cruel and oppressive ruler who was so smug and so self-gratifying that he believed no one could touch him even in his upstairs room. Oh, was he wrong? Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. Notice the difference. 
I believe the, f- the first time he said it was to lure him in. I have a secret message for you. Who, who doesn't love secret messages? <laughs> hmm? I also want to be I- in the know. But it's only when he got closer, he said, I actually have a secret message from God. Now again, I I think Eglon would have gone, okay, nothing strange about this. Because he probably would have watched him make his way out and and then stop at the idols that Eglon probably worshipped. And so he's now wondering, oh, I wonder as he was making his way there, maybe the God spoke to Ehud. And now he has a secret message from me. But no, 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 no. Ehud is like, I have a secret message from the real the one and true God. And the king stood up from his throne. Now, what happens next happens very quickly, but I believe it's, it's meant to be read kind of in slow motion. All right? Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into Eglon's belly. Even the handle went in after the blade. And Eglon's fat closed in over it. So that Ehud did not withdraw the sword from his belly. And then read this. And the waste came out. The ESV says the, the dung came out. Now, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't know what other words you guys want to use, but I hope you see the picture. Th- that's how deep Ehud put the blade. The fat closed over in it, and, and the waste fell out. Not a pretty sight. Ehud escaped by the way of the porch, closing and locking the doors of the upstairs room behind him. Ehud was gone when Eglon's servants came in, where were they? No one knows. They looked and found the doors of the upstairs room locked and thought he was relieving himself in the cool room. I think what happened is they got to the door, found that it was locked. Maybe went like this with their ear and it's like, I can't hear anything. And then went, but something smells. He must be relieving himself. Now, it must have been a regular thing, right? It must have been like, well, you know, this guy is what he does. The servants waited until they became embarrassed. It got weird, right? Can you imagine this? In fact, I want you to do that. Imagine this. Come with me on this journey. Standing outside the door, you can, I mean, it's the, the smell is filling the hallways. And you're like, man, at some point he's got to come out, right? And then nothing happens, and then nothing happens. I don't know how long they waited, 30, 45 minutes, an hour. It got weird. Th- then they're going like, back and forth between one another. So who's going to knock? You should knock. No, I think you should knock. No, you knock. And then they try, you know, a little bit. They're like, King Eglon, is everything okay? Nothing. And so they go in. The servants waited until they became embarrassed and saw that he had still not opened the door of the upstairs room. So they took the key and opened the doors. And I love this part. I, lo- I, I love this part. I, I believe, I mean, I can picture this, like, like the, the story being told generations after this, you know, and you're around a campfire and, 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 and the, the adults are telling the story and the kids are there and they, they're listening in anticipation because they've heard the story before. And they get to this part and all the kids are smiling. And there was their Lord lying dead on the floor. It's like the kids probably going, can we say that part? Can we say that part? And, and all together in unison, and there was their Lord lying dead on the floor. It must have made it into the nursery rhymes, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. It's that epic. And there was their Lord lying dead 
Friends, fast forward this to when Jesus is on the cross. He defeated sin, death, and Satan himself. That it's in that moment we can say, tomb is empty. Jesus has defeated sin. Yet there it is, dead. This is why we as the children of God should say, I teach this to my kids all the time, that we can say Satan is a loser. Because that is his fate. For those who mock God, those who oppose him, those who, who, who think, so what about him? This is their fate. Verse 26 goes on to tell us that, that Ehud escapes and the servants, they, like, they, they try to go after him, but he's already gone and he makes his way back to the Israelites and he says to them, guys, God has handed us victory and so they go with him and it's just epic. It's an epic story. We're told in verse 30 that Moab became subject to Israel that day and the land had peace for 80 years. Now, we read the story and we ask the question, okay, what's the point of all of this? Uh, we saw that it was somewhat comedic, somewhat funny, but, but here's the thing. There was nothing funny about the 18 years that Eglon oppressed the Israelites. 18 years of oppression. Nothing funny about that. Nothing laughable about their suffering. But things changed when God raised Ehud. The tone of the story changed. Those who mock God, those who oppose God, will sing a different tune in the not-so-distant future. That's what we should read here. And those who are mocked and opposed because of God, we will have an entirely different story when it's all said and done. You're trying to figure out, is there any hope in this story? There is. There is. Barry G. Webb says this. He says, laughter is not the normal emotional language of God's people in the Bible. More often they groan and weep, as Israel often does in Judges. This is the normal experience of sinful people living in a fallen world. But every now and then, laughter breaks through, as it does here in the story of Ehud. It breaks through because suddenly we are shown things as God sees them instead of how we have become accustomed to seeing them from our point of view. Tyrants like Eglon are terrifying. They do evil and good people seem powerless to resist them. They fill us with despair. But to God, they are laughable. This is why we as the children of God can press on. This is why we as the children of God can find hope in God because the story doesn't end with the tyrants. The story doesn't end with the brokenness. The story ends with God seated on his throne fully in control, victorious, and all of God's children share in that victory. Psalm chapter 2 says this, why do nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. Now I want to make the point here that I know that we can easily see those who, who oppose God, who mock him, who think nothing of him. Our, our posture towards them should not be, well, one day it's going to end badly for you. Our posture to them should be one of compassion because we know that it does not end well for them. 
our posture towards them should be pleading with them to see Jesus. This is why it's so important for us to communicate a clear, simple gospel. Because it's not just being a tyrant that God goes, yeah, that's, that's not going to end well for you. You know that when you don't obey the word of God, that's you opposing him? Think about that for a moment. That, that it's not just, it's not just the, 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 the dictator and, and the one who slaughters innocent people. It's not just them who oppose God. It's even us when we, when we go, well, God, I'm going to do things my own way. I'm going to handle things on my own. I'm not going to be obedient to your word. I'm not going to trust you. That's mocking God. Mocking the creator and the sustainer of this world. Friends, we should be filled with compassion. That we should walk into our week and go, this is not how you are to live. That there is something better for you. Please, 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 would you bend the knee? Would you put your faith in Christ? Psalm 2 is a real psalm. I'd encourage you to go read the rest of it. God is seated on his throne. And from his perspective, he goes... One day, when Jesus returns, all of this will end. All of this foolishness will end. All of this wickedness will end. All of this darkness will end. New Testament writers quote Psalm 2 four times in reference to the victory Jesus won over sin and Satan and the evil powers of this world by his death and resurrection. I mean, who would have ever imagined that when Jesus stood beaten and bloodied when he stood before Pilate who represented the tremendous strength of the Roman Empire he, this is Jesus, was about to establish a kingdom that would conquer Rome and outlast it for more than 2,000 years who would have ever thought who would have ever thought how laughable from this perspective were Rome's allusion to what absolute power means. Ehud's deliverance of Israel for 80 years is small in comparison to this, and his story is so different from the account of Christ's victory that it may seem ridiculous for us to even compare the two. Ehud's character and methods are utterly unlike those of Jesus. Some might say Ehud was devious, he was cunning, whereas Jesus was honest and truthful. Ehud was a man of violence, Jesus a man of peace. And so on, and so on, and so on. But having said that, there are some significant points of similarity between the two. Both were deliverers, both raised up by God, both were unlikely deliverers with unpromising origins, and both had the appearance of weakness rather than strength. Both faced the enemy alone and overcame him. Both were later revealed as victorious and summoned others to share in their victory. Both overcame the world. For Ehud was represented by, by Moab and King Eglon. And both of them achieved rest and blessing for everyone else. Friends, when we read the story of Ehud, we should not make the mistake that it is pointing us to the story of Christ. A better deliverer, a better judge, one that we desperately need. And this is why when we say the tomb is empty, we say it with conviction and we say it with joy. That we don't have to live under the oppressive hand of the Eglons, but we live in the blessing of God our Father. The tomb is empty. Judges longed for this reality, but we live in light of it. But here's the beautiful thing about God's family. 
for all of those who trust in God, we all share in the victory of the resurrection. That all of us look to Jesus, past, present, and future. We look to the, the promise that he defeated sin, death, and darkness. And so the question is, will you see Jesus for Jesus? Will you put your trust in him? Will you be obedient to him? Let us not be like Eglon and many others who were like him, who choose to mock God and think of him as not strong because he looks weak. But he is strong and allows all of us who are weak to find strength in him. And so I'm going to pray here in a moment and we're going to sing some songs, but, but I, I really want us to think about this for a moment, to not let this just be another story and another sermon, but to ask the question, how do I then respond to this? How do I respond to these words? How do I respond to a God who gives us his son? For some of us, it means that we're going to pray and ask God, to, to remove this idea that we have of who the Savior of the world is. And God, would you put before us Jesus, the real Jesus, not a counterfeit gospel, but a real gospel, and may it take over our lives. May we truly surrender. May we lay down our burdens and lay down our crowns. It's, it's not one or the other, but it's both. To the true Savior of the world. And so I'm asking the band to come up. And they're going to they're gonna sing, but, but friends, for real, I want you to sit there and to really ask the question, where am I in light of my relationship with Jesus? M maybe you're in a season of, of trials and testing, and the temptation is to give up on God because you believe he's not there for you anymore. We need to be a people who are able to trust God's heart even when we don't always see his hand. that to believe in Christ who right now is seated at the right hand of the Father, he's victorious. And then he calls us to share in that victory. That we can live a life of freedom. Even in this world, as we await his return, we can live a life of freedom. And so, Father God, we thank you for your word. As it reminds us of who you are and, and the truth that we hold on to. God, I, th I think of Ehud and it reminds me that it's not always about our ability but it's about our availability. And so God, right now I pray for folks here who, who are probably coming and saying, God, here's what I can do and here's what I can do and here's what I can do when God, all you're saying is I just want you to be with me. Be with me. Be seated with me. To be in your presence. And that only happens when we see Jesus for who he is. As the truth, as the way and as the life. God, help us to see that Jesus, you came and lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that we all deserve. That God, you pour out, you pour out your justice on your son. You poured out your wrath on him. That he bled for us. That's the savior that we need. 